Take a minute and think about how many things you've used today that need a battery. We're surrounded by them. The one in your car represents a $53 billion market. The kind in your phone, $23 billion. Plus, in under 10 years, those markets are expected to grow to $81 and $93 billion, respectively. But how much do you know about how batteries actually work? A battery is a device inside of which a chemical reaction happens that generates electricity. It's an electrochemical device, and for it to work, you need two different metals and a substance called an electrolyte. A standard AA battery, for example, uses zinc and manganese dioxide. This all started in 1799, when an Italian scientist named Alessandro Volta invented what would become known as the voltaic pile, the first modern battery. The initial invention by Volta was uh, basically a stack of coins, uh, silver and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. It would uh, deliver electric current on demand. And that's the way things were for about 60 years. And already during that time, within 10 years of the publication of Volta's invention, uh, people were pulling it out into, the, uh, into commerce. So the metals Volta used were zinc and silver, and the electrolyte was just salt water. And you'll notice that as we talk about later battery tech, the innovations happen when scientists figure out how to swap out one of those two things, the metals or the electrolyte. Things changed again in 1831, when a British scientist named Michael Faraday invented the dynamo, a generator, and we were finally able to get electricity on demand. When electricity generation was invented as a result of the, the dynamo, then people started to think about rechargeable batteries, and that was when the lead acid battery was first uh, rolled out. Most of us are familiar with car batteries, so these are lead acid battery. These are very low in energy density, but operate for about a decade. They're extremely robust, but they're very large. And then after World War II, nickel cadmium batteries showed up and were used to power things like early camera flashes. After that, nickel metal hydride batteries came onto the scene and improved on nickel cadmium batteries in most every way. Both of these batteries are still used in certain things today and were at one point both used in electric vehicles. But then in 1991, Sony introduced the first commercial lithium ion battery. And once again, everything changed. Sony was able to produce a, the lithium ion battery we know today. This technology allowed another doubling of energy density and allowed for now these small consumer devices to be on a scale that one can hold and put in your pocket. Today's lithium ion battery has enabled the revolution of electric cars. They have enabled the revolution of consumer electronics like laptops and cell phones. Lithium ion is, is here to stay for the foreseeable future. It's a proven technology. It's the, the best we've got, and it's the right technology for mobile handheld devices, whether it's uh, phones and, and computers, tablets, and so on. Lithium ion batteries have had a transformative effect on electronics, and the industry has exploded. The lithium ion battery market was worth $23 billion in 2016, but that's expected to jump to $93 billion by 2025. Electric cars are a huge reason why. Tesla, for example, is betting big on lithium ion. Its cars use battery packs made up from thousands of lithium ion battery cells. Individually, they look like slightly larger AA batteries, but together they generate enough power to move a car. These cells are made by Panasonic for Tesla at its massive Gigafactory 1 battery factory outside Reno, Nevada. The factory works around the clock and cranks out about two of these huge battery packs every minute. The battery remains the costliest part of the vehicle, so it's really, really important that we improve our efficiency and the design so that we make them more affordable. The more electric vehicles out there, the better. Any new battery technology has to compete with lithium-ion batteries if the battery technology is to be viable for the huge market of electric vehicles. Unfortunately, it is very challenging to design a battery that can decrease in cost faster than the lithium-ion battery, and this is largely being the reason why lithium-ion battery is and will be the dominating technology for electric vehicles in the next 10 to 20 years. But nonetheless, this current generation of lithium-ion batteries is not the end of the road for battery tech. We've been working on lithium-ion, per se, since the, uh, since the early 90s, but that has evolved from cobalt oxide to nickel oxide to manganese oxide to now we have some combination of all three metals to give sort of the best battery we know 
we know of today. And while American scientists have invented their fair share of battery technology, lately other countries like South Korea, China, and Japan have been leaders in improving batteries, continuously making them more powerful and more efficient. With millions upon millions of battery-powered devices being produced, where we get the elements that go into them and what happens to them at their end of life are both big concerns. Elements like cobalt, for example, a known conflict mineral, are currently needed to produce most lithium-ion batteries. A battery is a closed device. It doesn't output any carbon dioxide. It doesn't release any harmful chemicals. So in that sense, it is very environmental friendly. However, that is not a complete view of a battery life cycle. And we're talking about many billions of batteries that are now reaching their end of life. Researchers are working on two main solutions, how to best recycle the component materials and how these batteries can be reused in other applications. One of the other biggest things that material scientists are working on right now is developing large-scale energy storage technologies. It's these types of huge batteries that are going to link intermittent renewables like solar or wind power with the grid. I think that people don't realize that the grid operates such that the electricity powering this conversation was generated just moments ago. It's all just in time. The grid is the world's largest supply chain with zero inventory. If, for example, it's a beautiful sunny day and we've got a super abundance of electricity, we can't use it. Supply must be in balance with demand everywhere at all times. So batteries, it's everything. The takeaway here is that if we had really, really big battery systems that could store renewable energy and then inject that energy into the grid when and where we want them to, it could transform the world's electricity systems for the better. Tesla's Powerwall does this at the home level, but the hope is to do it on a city level. Tesla is one of the companies working on that too, though, and last year it opened the world's largest lithium-ion battery facility on a wind farm in Australia. But right now, systems like this are few and far between. To be able to store the electricity generated by wind and solar, you need a technology that is perhaps 10 or 20 times less expensive than today's lithium-ion battery technology. So you don't have to worry about uh, temperature of operation because it's not going to be put on your lap or next to your face. You don't have to worry about energy density because you're not going to be moving it. What you really care about is safety, a service lifetime. And if you can give me something that's big, cheap, safe, then I don't care about things like watt hours per kilogram. And there are a number of uh, contenders out there but the future is not going to be a mirror of the past. If we want to get 5x better, we've got to do something that's radically different from everything that's been done up until now. And um, I'm really excited about that.